And so it's this symbiotic relationship between the German royals, which began with George I, and also the German court Jews, who are the Rothschilds today and their friends, who actually control Zionism and communism in the world today. So let's have a look now at the history of the Rothschild plan through communism and Zionism. Karl Marx was born to a family of rabbinical Ashkenazi Jews in Trier in Prussia in 1818. Marx's Jewish name is Chaim Herschel Mordecai. His grandfather was a rabbi. His father owned Marcel Vineyards and during the Napoleonic Wars joined the Freemasons in Prussia. When Marx moved to London in 1849, he changed his name from Chaim Herschel Mordecai to Karl Heinrich Marx. One of Marx's grandparents was Nanette Salomon Baron Cohen, who came from a wealthy Jewish family from Amsterdam. Her first cousin married Nathan Mayer Rothschild of London. That made Karl Marx a third cousin of Baron Lionel Rothschild. The idea of Marx being a Rothschild agent or shill was raised by Marx's contemporary from the First International and other atheistic communists. His name was Mikhail Bakunin, and in 1869 said, this world is now, at least for the most part, at the disposal of Marx on one hand and of a Rothschild, that is Lionel, on the other hand. This may seem strange. What can there be in common between socialism and a leading bank? The point is that authoritarian socialism, or Marxist communism, demands a strong centralization of the state. And where there is centralization of the state, there must necessarily be a central bank. And where such a bank exists, the parasitic Jewish nation speculating with the labour of people will be found. So it was Baron Lionel de Rothschild, Member of Parliament for the City of London, who was the utmost propagator of both communism and Zionism from Great Britain, and it all began in the City of London. First Lionel's support went to the Communist Conventions held on the second floor of the Red Lion Pub in Soho, London, where the two German Jews, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, were given the mandate to write the Communist Manifesto. Second, Lionel was responsible for his own writing called The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. By outlining the protocols, Lionel was doing the same thing the Communist Manifesto did, which was to provide guidance to future revolutionaries. Baron Lionel Rothschild was following the Rothschild plan laid down by his grandfather, by Mayor Amschel Rothschild in Frankfurt in 1773. The protocols were released at the First Zionist Congress at Basel, Switzerland in 1897. Another prominent Jew in England, Baron Israel Moses Seif, was born in Manchester, where his father, a migrant from Lithuania, started a prosperous business. He and his two brother-in-laws, Simon Marx and Harry Sasha, were all devoted to Zionism which is the religious side of Judaism as opposed to the atheistic communists. In 1913, Seif and Marx became known to Chaim Wiseman, who was the lecturer at Manchester University. Manchester was a major centre for British Zionism. And when the Federal Reserve was formed in 1913 in America, Israel Moses Seif's name was one of the original shareholders alongside the Rothschilds. And so there was a succession of Rothschilds in the British Parliament in the 19th century who paved the way for Jews to enter into the society of Great Britain. And the first was Lionel, of course, who had his struggles in getting into the House of Commons. And then he was succeeded by Baron Nathan Rothschild, who was the first Rothschild to enter into the House of Lords. And then he was succeeded for a while by Ferdinand. And then in 1899, Walter de Rothschild took up the Aylesbury seat as the member in Parliament. And it was to Walter that the Balfour Declaration was requested by Lord Balfour when the British Parliament wrote to the Rothschilds to establish a homeland for the Jews in Palestine. Such is the power of the Rothschilds. In 1917, there's something called the Balfour Declaration. Foreign Secretary Arthur James Balfour writes a letter to Britain's most illustrious Jewish citizen, Baron Lionel Walter Rothschild, expressing the British government's support for a Jewish homeland in Palestine. You can see this, it's very simple, small letter. Dear Lord Rothschild. And he basically said, 
we need to set up a little place in Palestine for the Jewish people. Take care of that for us. Please, help us out. And it's funny that the British asked the Rothschilds to make it happen because they're so powerful. And Chaim Weizmann became president of the Zionist organization and later was the first president of Israel in 1948. The President of Israel, Dr. Chaim Weizmann, meets America's President, Harry Truman, and gives him a Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. Later, at Blair House, the official guest house for visiting dignitaries, Dr. Weizmann tells reporters the two major points which he discussed with President Truman. Once the lifting of the embargo, I have uh, tried to explain to the President that it is essential for us, for our safety, for our fight there in Palestine, that the embargo should be lifted as soon as possible. The other point, which is of uh, equal importance, was uh, the discussion of a loan, uh, not a very uh, big loan, but a uh, medium-sized loan. For American standards, it is probably very small. But we have a tiny country. For our tiny country, it's quite a considerable chunk of money. Dr. Weitzman, after thanking America for its friendship, sails for France. He states regretfully that he is bypassing England, his home, because Britain has failed to recognize Israel. But he voices the Jews' desire to live in friendship with both Britain and the Arabs. But of course that is just a propaganda video put out by the Jewish-controlled international press. And we know that once the establishment of a Jewish homeland took place in Israel in 1948, then they began fighting with the Arabs as they continuously have ever since. And also the British were kicked out of Israel with the bombing of the King David Hotel. It was one of the most audacious acts of terror the world had ever seen. They used 350 kilos of gel ignite and TNT, and they planted the bomb in broad daylight in a building full of people. Nearly 60 years on, and it is as fresh in the memory as ever for those involved. I was running as fast as I could, with the bomb on my shoulder. There were a lot of explosives inside. It was heavy. The bomb killed 91 people and 45 others were injured. But little did the bombers of Jerusalem's King David Hotel back in 1946 know that they were one day to be hailed as the founding fathers of a new age of terror. For their success inspired waves of imitators around the world. If my sacrifice for that is to be called a terrorist, then I'm glad to have been a terrorist for liberation. We didn't mind being called terrorists then, because we actually used force, such force, a brutal force, in order to uh, get rid of them. We knew we only had one chance in a thousand of coming out alive. The death was around every corner. This is the story of the birth of modern terrorism, of the activists who invented it, and of how it has been appropriated and dispersed around the globe. Oh Jerusalem, cradle of faith to Muslim, Jew and Christian alike. Jerusalem, the birthplace of modern terrorism. After a bomb explosion caused by terrorists on the British headquarters of Jerusalem, one entire corner of the King David Hotel, a building of seven stories, was raised to the ground. The stone floors were cut clean... In scenes eerily reminiscent of New York 55 years later, the Jerusalem bomb was the beginning of terrorism as a media event, designed to capture the world's attention. The latest casualty list included 65 killed, 47 injured. The perpetrators, Zionist Jews, members of Menachem Begin's Irgun terrorist network. Begin, who would one day become Prime Minister of Israel, described this tactic as turning Palestine into a glass house, where the entire world was looking in. 
I think it was one of these acts of violence that ahead of its time, I mean, in an era before CNN, before instantaneous news, was choreographed precisely to attract international attention. We were a minority, but we were a minority with a clear ideology that we must have a Jewish state to rebuild the state which was existing many, many hundreds of years ago. The bombing of the King David Hotel was perhaps one of the most significant terrorist incidents of the 20th century. Uh, for many decades, it actually held the infamous record of having killed the largest number of people. In a fight for, for liberty, you have always those who are more called them extreme or more uh, adamant or call them uh, staunch, and they want it immediately, not to wait for the Messiah. Still lying under the shadow of terrorist attacks, many areas of Palestine are... By the end of World War II, the British, who had been made responsible for looking after Palestine by the old League of Nations 27 years earlier, found it to be a serious headache. They were caught in the middle of the Arabs and the Jews, both of whom wanted the country for their own, were unwilling to peacefully coexist, and were agreed on only one thing, their hatred of the British, whom they both saw as foreign occupiers. The British military and administrative headquarters was here, in the south wing of the King David Hotel in Jerusalem. The luxury hotel itself still functioned with guests, restaurants, bars, and Sudanese waiters. Jerusalem in that time, it was a, a fortress. And I walk through the town, and put in my mind every place and think about how can we attack this place. If we succeed, it's very important the whole world will, will see that we can fight even the British. Begin and Ellis decided on a daring plan. They would strike at the very heart of British rule, the King David Hotel itself. If they succeeded here, the whole world would take notice. The terrorist bomb was hidden in seven milk churns and delivered in a hijacked pickup truck to the hotel's basement kitchen. We jumped out and everyone took up their positions. I took the churn and started to run. I was thinking, how do I get to the place where I have to put the churn down? That's how I started. Anyway, there were lots of people around in the corridor, and we tried to move them out of the way. Here, there, to the side. But there were some who resisted, but we threatened them with our weapons. I wasn't dressed as a civilian or a soldier. I was dressed like an Arab, with a jalaba and a kafir, with that ring on your head. You know, like, uh, oh, what's he called? The, the leader of the Arabs. You know, Arafat. There were seven churns, weighing 350 kilos in all. I ran until I reached the place where I had to put it down, with the churn on my shoulder. I carried on, carried on, until I got to the place where the British people were. I saw a pillar that used to be here, and I put the churn down and ran away immediately. I waited in my position until all the churns were together and then the time would come for the explosion. All the churns together were like one whole man, a complete bomb. The bomb went off at 12.37 and was devastating. But of the 91 dead, only 28 were British. 17 Jews died alongside 41 Arabs. Of all these, 54 were innocent civilians, unconnected to the British authorities in any way. It's classic terror in that it's off the mainstream. 